Good evening of May. I add my welcome to you all who are joining us, whether here in church or uh, this evening or catching up later online. After a wonderful, if slightly more um, noisy, uh, all eight carol service this evening, for me, this is always the point where Christmas begins. All the shops are closed. A quietness begins to descend, and it's too late to worry if we've got enough to eat or a print for Great Aunt Mildred. And we can focus on the true message of Christmas. Now, I think it's fair to say it's a universal truth that humility is not a characteristic generally associated with leaders, past or present. Whether it was the pharaohs of ancient Egypt, the Caesar who ruled, the Roman Empire, medieval kings or emperors or modern presidents, despots, sultans, grand muftis, prime ministers, few if any are characterized by their humility. The previous president of the United States was on record as saying, amongst many other things, that he went to church but did say the words of the confession as he hadn't done anything wrong. Respect of any political views you may have, I just leave that observation with you about the character of the man. There are, of course, occasional exceptions to that rule, as there are to all. Perhaps the most obvious in recent times, or relatively recent times, was Mahatma Gandhi, who had adopted what is still regarded as a very unconventional approach in his campaign for Indian independence until he was assassinated assassinated at a multi-faith prayer meeting in 1948 for his perceived defence of the newly formed Pakistan. But the sad reality is, in the dog-eat-dog -dog world in which we live, that true humility is a characteristic that's rarely found. There was a dreadful song from, I think, the 1980s, and don't worry, I'm not going to sing it for you, which claimed, Oh Lord, it's hard to be humble when you're perfect in every way. I can't wait to look in the mirror as I get better looking each day. To know me is to love me. I must be a heck of a man. Oh, Lord, it's hard to be humble, but I'm doing the best that I can. I had to change one of the words there, as I can't use the original in church. The character Uriah Heep in Dickens' David Copperfield constantly professes a false humility. I'm ever so humble. Apparently the modern term, this sort of false humility, is humble bragging. No, I hadn't come across the word either. But apparently it's to say something disparaging about yourself, but you're in fact using this to point out how exceptional you are. But this evening, Christmas Eve, we celebrate the birth of the one person in all eternity who demonstrates true humility. So come back with me about 2,000 years to a stable in Bethlehem as we wonder once again at the events that changed history for all eternity as they unfolded there. If you've closed Bibles, can I encourage you to open them again to Philippians chapter 2, which you can find on page 1,179 of the Church Bibles. Just a little bit of context before we get into it. Philippi, it was a city in northwestern Greece which was named after Philip of Macedon who was the father of Alexander the Great, two characters renowned for their humility. And about a hundred or so years before Paul wrote this letter, it had been the scene of the decisive battle in which the army loyal to the murdered Julius Caesar, fighting under the command of Octavian, later the Emperor Augustus and Mark Antony, defeated the rebel forces led by Brutus and Cassius. And in honour of the event, Philippi had been declared to be a colony, making it in effect Rome in miniature, but way up in northwestern northern Greece, northeastern Greece. And Paul had founded the church there during the course of his second great missionary journey between 49 and 52 AD. And this letter to the church in Philippi was written a few years later in about AD 61, while Paul was in prison in, in Rome. And it, it's a letter filled with joy. The Philippians have been a great encouragement to Paul, and he wrote in this very personal expression of his love and affection. And throughout, Paul focuses on the person of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Saviour. And this is very much at the heart of our reading this evening. And in it, Paul calls on the Philippians, and down the ages, each one of us gathered here this evening who confess Jesus as Lord of our lives, 
to follow Jesus' example in words recorded in chapter 2 and starting to read from verse 5. Your attitude, and down the century our attitude, Paul says, should be the same as that of Christ Jesus, who, being in very nature God, didn't consider equality something to be grasped or used to his advantage, but made himself nothing. Taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, being found in appearance as man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above all names, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. It's widely thought these words form part of an ancient hymn been sung in Greek and we've no idea of the tune but as with all the best hymns down the ages there are so many truths packed into these verses and I want to draw out just four brief points this evening and we'll focus primarily on the first one of these which is that Jesus was and is equal with God secondly he made himself nothing thirdly he became obedient to death even death on a cross and fourthly that now he is glorified. Paul begins by telling us that Christ Jesus was and is in the very nature of God. There are those who deny that Jesus is God, arguing he was just a great teacher and leader, an example to imitate, and he is all of these things, but he is so much, for, so much more. For as Paul affirms, Jesus is in the very nature of God. If Jesus wasn't God, then Jesus' death on the cross was all in vain, but more of that later. And if we're in any doubt about who Jesus is, our second reading, those glorious opening verses of John's Gospel, should leave no doubts. As John affirms that Jesus, the Word, the Word was there in the beginning, that he was with God, that he was and is God, that through him all things were made, and that in him was life, and that life was light of all mankind. Let's just take a moment to reflect on the enormity of what those verses mean. But John tells us that Jesus is no mere mortal. Rather, he is the word who was there in the beginning. He was there in the beginning even before time began, before there was any creation. Jesus was there, the word was there. Before the world and all creation was brought into being, Jesus was one with the Father in heaven, and that nothing in heaven and earth was created without Jesus' involvement. I started work many years ago in Teesside, up in the northeast, and a popular outing on a nice summer's evening was a walk up a local landmark, Rosebury Topping, just on the edge of the North Yorkshire Moors, a few miles just to the south of Teesside itself. And from there, you could stand on the top of the hill and look out across the vast industrial expanse of Teesside. At the time, one of the largest concentrations of industry in the country, and very impressive it seemed. All those chimneys, belching smoke and cooling towers, steaming away. A testament to man's capabilities. But, however great or however ugly, depending on your point of view, it was but a limited scar on the landscape, an area about five miles wide, 15 or so miles long. All of that set within the context of God's creation, which stretched as far as the eye could see. The moors stretching away to the south and the east. On a clear day, you could see across to the Pennines and the Yorkshire Dales in the west. Just a very small illustration of the gulf that exists between the greatness of God's creation and the best that human endeavour could achieve. Yet God's created so much more than the hills of northeast England. Despite all man's endeavours, we get to discover the bounds of the universe that God created. Or we'll fathom its deepest secrets, let alone the secrets of the ocean deep on our own planet. And yet Jesus, whose birth by tradition we celebrate this night, was nothing less than the creator of everything it is, seen and unseen. 
and with the remarkable economy of words John expresses the reality of who Jesus is, the co-creator of all that is. Wherever we look, whether we seek the farthest extremities of space or the smallest subatomic particles, we find God's handiwork, the work of the word. As we look around us, despite man's best efforts, we find order in creation, a creation that consistently obeys a set of rules and which makes scientific endeavor viable. Just imagine, for example, a world in which gravity or friction failed to act consistently. We live in a world, a created order, that is utterly consistent. And Jesus is one with God, as the writer of the Hebrews put it, Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Amidst all the change and uncertainty of this world, Jesus Christ, the creator, and as we shall see, the redeemer of all mankind, is the unshifting rock who is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And hopefully we can begin to grasp how Jesus is one with God, how all things were created by him, how nothing was made that was made other than by Jesus how in him was life, how Jesus was present with God before all we see came into being. Such greatness far exceeds all human comprehension to the extent that all glory, honor, dominion, and power are due to Jesus. And now we come to the most truly remarkable thing about Christmas, which is that Jesus, the Son of God, the Father, the creator of all that is seen and unseen, chooses to lay aside all the might, majesty, dominion and power that are his by rights to come to earth, to be born in a stable, to live as a man in a backwater of the Roman Empire. Imagine if a future sovereign of this country chose to leave their life of safety, security, honour and privilege, turn back on a choice of comfortable palaces or country retreats, to live in a one-bedroom flat on a rough estate in one of our great conurbations. Such an act would seem truly incomprehensible to most people. Now consider Jesus, the creator of the universe, leaving behind the splendor of heaven, leaving the seat of honor at the right hand of his heavenly Father, where he worshipped unceasingly by angels, to be born in a stable and troubled backwater of Roman Empire. Those amongst us who know what it is to have children, whether it's a mother going through the challenges of childbirth or an anxious father awaiting the birth of their child, we will, I am sure, all value the benefits that modern medicine, medicine brings. But sadly, despite this, tragedies do still occur. For those who opt for home, that's every effort we made to make sure the house is clean, warm and dry. Oh, imagine what it would be like to exchange the delivery suite for a stable with all the cell, the noise, the mess. But that was the reality of what sliced for our Lord, the creator of heaven and earth. Throughout his life here on earth, there was no cry of, I'm God, get me out of here. Rather, the one who was creator of everything seen and unseen laid aside his majesty to be born in a stable, to live as the son of a carpenter in first, Palestine, first century Palestine, a land harshly subjugated by the hated Roman occupiers. Jesus didn't use his equality with God to get out of things he couldn't face or seek to use his position to his advantage as some are wont to do. Many years ago I had the pleasure of meeting Jerry Fines, distant relative of Sir Ranulph Fines, the explorer. Jerry Fines had been responsible for transforming British Railway's eastern region when he was general manager in the 1960s, including the introduction of the Delta locomotives to dramatically accelerate service between London, Edinburgh and points between, but that's another story for a different occasion, a different audience. But he recounted with great glee how on one occasion there had been, well, been rather a nasty collision. He'd gone to the scene to see what was happened, determine what assistance was needed. And there's a young police constable guarding access to the site who sought to bar his way. At which point he said, I drew myself up to my full heart. I told him that I was Gerard Wickham Twistleton Fines, general manager of this railway, and that I was going through. 
even the constable somewhat taken aback. <laughs> Jesus, by contrast, did none of that. He willingly laid aside everything that was his by rights to come to earth as servant of us all. Which brings us to my third point, that Jesus came as a servant and humbled himself to death, even death on a cross. Although slavery was abolished in this country over two centuries ago, slavery in all its forms remains rife across the world. My own grandmother was in service as a young woman in the 1920s. And in Jesus' time as now, even if not a slave, a servant was the lowest of all in the household. And yet Jesus willingly took on that role, the role of a servant, the servant king. More than that, he became willingly obedient to death, even death on the cross. A form of execution that was so barbarous, so horrific, that it couldn't be used to execute Roman citizens. Unless Christ should come again beforehand, an inevitable part of our human condition is that we will all one day face death. Modern medicine may extend our lives, but eventually illness, old age, accident or misfortune will bring our earthly life to an end. We may question why Jesus, the eternal world, word, it willingly became obedient to death and death on a cross. And the reality is that it's impossible to separate Christmas and Easter. And it's good to see that our supermarkets had hot cross buns on the shelves recently alongside the more usual seasonal connections, although I doubt that's driven by any theological considerations. The birth of a baby is hopefully a cause for celebration. The birth of Jesus is definitely a time for great celebration. We have to look beyond Jesus' birth to Easter to truly make sense of Christmas. And we have a clue in Jesus' name. Matthew tells in his gospel that when the angel appeared to Joseph, tell him that Mary was to have a son, the angel told him you were to give him the name Jesus because he will save his people their sins. For by becoming obedient to death, Jesus bore the punishment due to each of us for the things that we've all done wrong. Jesus paid the price for our sins so that on the last day when Christ comes again to judge all the earth, all those who put their faith in Jesus' redeemed work on the cross will be declared not guilty. For God is a just and holy God. Just as under our legal system, a person cannot be punished twice for the same crimes, God cannot punish us twice for the same sin. And because Jesus has taken the punishment first time around, as he died on the cross, all who accept his gracious gift will stand not guilty on that last day. And this is what John means. He writes, he came to that which was his own, but they didn't receive him. Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Children born not of natural descent, not of human decision or a husband's will. But we are born of God. And the real joy of Christmas is found at Easter. As Jesus gave up his spirit amongst his last recorded words after that great cry of desolation, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Was it finished or it accomplished? What was it that Jesus had accomplished? Well, nothing less than the defeat of sin and death. A victory made real on Easter Sunday as Jesus rose again from the tomb to eternal life, which brings me very briefly to my final point this evening, which is that Jesus is exalted to the highest place, given a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee shall bow. Having been raised by God from the dead, demonstrating his offering of himself had been accepted. Forty days later on Ascension Day, God the Father raised Jesus to heaven and seated him in the highest place that heaven afford, where he sits to this day at the right hand of God the Father, bringing the Christmas story full circle. Jesus, the word of God, one with Father since before time began, who left his might, majesty, dominion, power, and glory behind to come to earth to be born a stable, whose birth we celebrate this night, to live as a man, as a servant, yet Emmanuel, God with us, who became obedient to death, even death on the cross, now sits exalted at the right hand of Father in heaven. At Christmas we celebrate the birth of Jesus, the eternal word of God, the saviour of the world. My hope and prayer this evening 
is if you've yet to discover the reality of who Jesus is, the real meaning of Christmas, to acknowledge him as your Lord and Saviour, that you would follow in the footsteps of Thomas, doubting Thomas, who having doubted the reality of the resurrection would go on to confess the risen Lord Jesus as my Lord and my God. If you've got questions, if you'd like to know more, Speak to Mike or John or James or myself this evening before you go. Come along to the Hope Explored event that's running in January there. My prayer is that Jesus would come to be the light of your light amid life amidst the darkness of this world in which we live. And for those of us who do know Christ as our Lord, may we celebrate with wonder once again God's love come down at Christmas time. May we live lives which follow the example set for us by our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. And I take this opportunity to wish you all a very happy Christmas. Amen. <laughs>